Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come and to worship you, Lord. And now we have the opportunity to hear a message now from you, Lord. I pray that you speak through me and that it's not my words, Lord, but it's yours and that my um, fallen state, my spiritual limitations do not hinder your message today, Lord. And Lord, I pray that your church, your people, would hear it and receive it with gladness and that they would recognize that you are speaking them to them at this moment, Lord, because you love them and you care for them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Alright. And just for children's sake, we're all going to stay in today as well. So, the title of my message today is Biblical Repentance. And just to give you a little story of why I chose to speak on this today was I was actually at dinner with um, a few Christian friends probably a few weeks ago. And we were just out at dinner having a good fellowship night. And we started talking about past times that we had all hung out, things we had done together, things that one or two of us had done with somebody else. And we, had, we started talking about and remembering different fun times. And it got to the point where at one moment we started talking about some things that we had done wrong in our past at different times. And we started talking about it. And it was just, I started to notice a trend of what we were doing. Every single time we would talk about something bad we had done, we made it kind of sound a little cutesy. Or we kind of said like, yeah, those were my bad days. Or, yeah, I messed up there. Or, yeah, I wasn't being a very good boy that day. You know, we said all these cool acrobatic ways to say what we really weren't saying, which was sin. And... I just started to think about that as we were at dinner, and I actually ended up just kind of calling it what it was. And I was guilty. I was guilty party too, because I was at first saying the same things. And then I said, well, hold on a second. That, that's it. We were sinning. You sinned. And I could just tell, I could read my, these are Christian friends that I was having dinner with. I could read their faces, and they were saying, they, I could tell that it kind of changed the mood for a second. <clears throat> I could tell that it was just a little uncomfortable for us to go from saying, we messed up or, you know, we weren't being a good boy to I was sinning. And I then, I started to think about that a little bit more. I thought, why is it that Christians who regularly come on Sunday morning to worship a Savior who died on the cross for our sins, is it that whenever we're going through the week, it seems that sin, and specifically calling someone to repent, is almost never brought up. We'll say, you probably need to clean up your act. You need to do better. Work harder, try better. You know, we, we use all these cool phrases or words, but you don't use the biblical language for some reason. Because <clears throat> it's easy to say, love, faith, believe, trust, God. Most of those words, people probably don't have a problem if you say those. But you start to say, you're in sin. You need to repent. All of a sudden, we get a little, oh, that sounds a little, I don't like that. That sounds like a judgmental Christian. No, that sounds like a biblically accurate Christian. So, now all that being said, I'm not trying to just, you know, ram it down your throat and say, you need to tell everybody they're a sinner and repent all the time. I'm not saying that by kidding me. And if you've been at this church long enough, you know for a fact that it's not what we do here. But, if you are not ever talking about sin, and if you have never said to yourself, that you need to repent? If you've ever said to a loved one who was in sin that they are in sin and they need to repent, then you are missing a critical aspect of the gospel. So you cannot have the biblical gospel, you cannot have biblical foundations in scripture if you are not talking about sin and repentance. So all that being said, I know it can be a little uncomfortable to talk about. I'm not trying to say that, you just like I said, I don't want you to go out of here thinking, Zach said, every single person I see sin, I need to yell at and call them a sinner. I'm not saying that. Everything we do is with love and charity and grace. But we do need to call a spade a spade sometimes. 
So with that being said, before we go into, I have three points that are going to be on your bulletin if you'd like to fill them out as we go. It's an interactive outline for you. But before I get to that, I thought, well, maybe we should kind of talk about what biblical repentance actually means. And I left this little symbol up here, hopefully is helpful to remind us, because usually whenever someone asks me, <clears throat> what does repentance mean? A lot of people will usually say to turn, or to turn away from, to turn from sin, to do a 180 degree turn, a U-turn, something like that. Which I definitely think that that is a strong aspect and part of repentance. See, because we get the Hebrew word shuv, which means to turn from sin and or to return to God. So we see that throughout the Old Testament. We see the word, the Hebrew word shuv. But then we see and gain more clarity on the word of repentance in the New Testament because we see a Greek word, metanoia. Now, metanoia means to change your mind. So, I think when we look at the Hebrew and the Greek from the Old and the New Testament, we begin to see a more complete picture of what biblical repentance is. We see that you must turn from sin. You must change your mind about who you are, what you are doing, where you are going, so that you can then turn or return to God. So biblical repentance is turning from sin, turning to God, changing your mind. So this has a complete aspect. It's the mind, it's the will, it's the desires, it's everything being committed to this transformative life, this turning away from. Okay, so that's what we mean by biblical repentance today. So my first point, discussing biblical repentance, is that repentance is relinquishing sin. What that means is it is getting rid of, ridding yourself, throwing away sin from your life. This comes from the text, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, which says this, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So in this text, you very clearly see the connection between repentance, conversion, which leads to then the concept of sins being blotted out so that you can be refreshed in the presence of the Lord. So we see this getting rid of, blotting out, relinquishing sin. So to be someone who is willfully repentant is someone who is willfully ridding themselves and relinquishing sin from their life. So, one thing I want to make a point about this though is it does not mean that you just recognize your sin. Because it's not hard. Any of us can probably point out some things that we do wrong in our lives. Things that we have fallen short in our areas. And we might not like to talk about it, but we can deep down, we know, we recognize places where we fall short. So it's not, do you recognize your sin? It's, are you relinquishing your sin? So this has something more than to understand that you have it, but it also has more to do than just an emotion. Sometimes we think, if you feel bad about your sin, if you feel guilty or remorseful or sorrowful, that's repentance. Now, I'm not saying emotions are not important when it comes to repentance. Because as I said earlier, repentance requires the total person. The totality of your being, meaning your mind, your will, your emotions, your actions, your behavior. Everything has to be included for biblical repentance. So it's not just an emotion. Now, why do I say that? Well, when we look to Scripture, I think there's a few examples of those who had sinned and felt the weight of their sin. They felt remorseful. They had sorrow. But they didn't change. The person I think of the most is Judas Iscariot. See, Judas, he was a follower of Jesus for his entire ministry. He is one of the twelve disciples. He saw all of the many miracles that Jesus did. 
But Judas allowed sin to creep into his life. Judas got greedy. Judas took money and betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Now, when he had done that, sometimes people think, oh, that was even a story for Judas. But there was more. You see that it says that he had great remorse. And he says that he had sinned. He had betrayed innocent blood. He recognized it. He was so remorseful. He, saw, he had sorrow. And it got to the point where he couldn't deal with it anymore. He committed suicide. He hung himself on a tree. Think about that. He got to a point where he was so sorrowful about his sin that he turned to a tree and hung himself. Where there was a tree that was offered for him for that sin. Just think about that. So just being really sorry about your sin, it doesn't cut it. Now it's important, but it needs to lead to your will, to your assent, to your behavior, to your actions. It involves the whole person. And that's why in this text you see repent, therefore, and be converted. Meaning, to repent is to become converted, to be transformed. So the way that you lived before Christ is not the way that you live after Christ. Repentance means you are changing. You are becoming new. And by the grace of God, you are able to do that. See, we know the text in James, I believe chapter 2, it says that faith without works is dead. Well, likewise, repentance without works is dead. Meaning, if you claim to be someone who has a repentant heart, if you are someone that says, I have repented of my sin, then your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, you have every right to question if that person is engaging in sin. Or engaging in that sin that they said that they repented from. Okay? Repentance necessitates works. Now I'm not saying, and I'll get into this later, I'm not saying that we work to earn or gain our salvation by no means. But true faith, just like true repentance, necessitates that we have good works that follow so then, the other point when it comes to repentance is relinquishing sin is that I don't want you to think that it's a one-time occurrence. Now it's true, there is a pivotal moment in which you repent of your sins and trust as Jesus as Lord and Savior, which is what this is discussing, to be converted. But we also know that it is an ongoing lifestyle choice, meaning you continue to choose to turn from your sins. Continue to turn towards God. Anytime that you are beginning to be convinced of an idea that is contrary to Scripture or Christ, you are called to renew and to change your mind on that sin, on that behavior. So every single day it says, Christ says to you, deny yourself, die to yourself. Take up your cross daily, it says. Meaning, Every single day, you need to evaluate and examine yourself and say, are there sins in my life that I have not repented from? Not do I recognize them, not do I feel bad about them, but have I repented from them? Have I repented from my sins? Because you must relinquish all of your sins. Now, I'm not saying you become perfect, because only Christ is perfect. And on this side of eternity, we will not be. But you must be so committed to the Lord in such a way that there is nothing in your life that you are going to hide or keep from the Lord. Meaning, there is nothing that is too great of a temptation that I'm going to keep this as my possession to keep me from God. You must relinquish. You must repent. You must turn from any <coughs> sin or anything that keeps you from God. So you must relinquish your sin to repent. So that asks the question then, are there sins in your life that you haven't repented of? 
Because it's not just actions. Now, the sin is an action, for sure. But sometimes it's just a thought. Maybe you're thinking to myself, well, I've done this for a long time, and now you're thinking and saying, but I could never, I could never do this. I could never truly get rid of this sin, or this addiction, or this thing that I do. That thought you're thinking, that's a sinful thought. Saying that God can't help you. God can't get you through it. Because God says he will make you a way of escape for any sin or temptation. So it might be a thought you need to repent of. Thinking that you can't do it on your own or that you can't do it with God. God isn't big enough over this sin or this temptation or this trial. Maybe it's a personal thing. Maybe it's something you continue to think about. Maybe it's a sexual sin or lust. And maybe you think about it and you're like, well, I haven't acted on it. But if you continue to think about it, entertain the idea, you need to repent of it. And then there's also the idea of sins by omission, meaning there are things that you are not doing. Are you reading scripture? Are you a Christian that says you believe God's word? If so, are you reading it? Do you read God's word? Are you a part of the bride of Christ? Are you a part of the church? If so, are you going to church? Are you regularly under the authority of elders and leaders in a church that continue to protect you and shepherd you and make sure that you're staying within the local bride? See, because if you choose not to read, if you choose not to pray, if you choose not to go to church, that is the sin of omission, choosing not to do something that God has called you to do. Likewise with evangelism. Are you sharing Christ with others? Now I'm not saying every single day of the week, every single moment you need to be reading scripture, you have to be praying right then and there every single time. You have to go and evangelize every single day. You have to get like five people every day. Otherwise you miss the mark and now you're sinning. I'm not saying that. I'm not being legalistic here. I'm not trying to control your life. But what I am saying is that God is very clear in scripture. And there are certain things he calls us to get rid of in our life, and there's things that he calls us to do, to act on. Therefore, if you choose not to engage these things that he calls you to do, that's known as the sin of omission. So, repentance is relinquishing sin. So I want to challenge you today, relinquish sin. Second one is repentance is required for salvation. Now, this little point here, I think, can be a little scandalous sometimes. You might look at it and think, this message is starting to get a little heavy and feel like it's all, all on me, all the works. Like, I'm saving myself here. Now, I want to hopefully ease that tension by saying, the third point, I'm going to really go into the, how it's not us that saves us by any means. It's Christ alone who saves us. Okay? But... You need to feel the healthy tension in Scripture that makes it very clear that there's something here that we are doing, and repentance is part of it. So that being said, we're going to look at two different texts here that talk about how repentance is required for salvation. The first one is Luke 13, verse 3. It says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This text is pretty clear here. Unless you repent, you will perish. This is a warning text. It's not that they're trying to judge you or be harsh or unkind. It's saying, it's just like saying, if you don't take the medicine, you're going to get sick. Or you're going to get worse. If you don't repent, you're going to perish. This is a warning text because they care for your soul. Likewise, Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 38. And it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this, Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent 
And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in this text, this is a Pentecost, where Peter has been preaching this wonderful message about Christ and what he did on the cross. And these people that are listening, they feel so convicted by the message. They recognize the weight of their sin and that they were responsible partly for Jesus being crucified. Because Jesus, the reason he went on the cross was because every single one of us have sinned. That's why Jesus went on the cross, because you sinned. Jesus died for sinners. And when these men heard this message, they said it cut them to the heart. And they said, what do we do? What is our response? What do we hear as the hearers? What is, what is our action? And what he says very clearly, he doesn't say, have faith. He doesn't say, just believe. Now that's important. But the very first thing that he says, it's so important, the very first thing, not even have a comma. It says, repent, comma. Repent is what he says. And then it follows it with an action. Let every one of you be baptized. Do you see that? So, repentance is required, and it's immediately followed by an action, which is getting baptized, publicly proclaiming your commitment to Christ and symbolically being synonymous with Christ as he is buried and resurrected and brought to life. So, maybe these two texts aren't convincing enough for you. You're thinking, well, maybe there's some way to explain those two um, verses. Maybe, maybe repentance isn't fully necessary. Well, if I can knock that argument out by any means, I would point to a few different things. When you look at all of the Old Testament prophets, Almost every single one, on multiple occasions, continue to call the Lord's people to repentance. Regularly. Regularly tells them that they need to turn from their sins so that they can trust and turn to the Lord. So all of the Old Testament prophets are saying this. But if that's not enough, when John the Baptist, who sometimes is known as the last Old Testament prophet, but he's in the New Testament obviously, John the Baptist is in the wilderness preaching repentance and baptism, baptizing people for the remission of their sins. So John the Baptist thought repentance was important. Then we see Jesus in the beginning of Mark's Gospel. One of the first things that it talks about Jesus preaching in his ministry is that he is preaching repentance. Then look at Pentecost, one of the biggest sermons ever in all of history, right? Peter, the first thing, the establishment of the church, Pentecost, and he is saying in this text, the first thing of what do we do now that we've heard this message? Repent. Repent. And then lastly, when we look at the Apostle Paul's letters, we see him calling the church to repent from sin, to change their mind about certain things, and to renew their minds in the truth of the gospel. So you see, Old Testament prophets, John the Baptist, Jesus, Peter, Paul. If you were looking for the big guys in Scripture, they're them. And they're all saying that we need to repent. So if it was good for these guys, and if this is the list of the people that are preaching repentance, I want to be one of those guys that's following suit. And I think hopefully at the church, we want to be people that are listening to that. So, that being said, Repentance is required for salvation. I hate to tell you this, there are no exceptions here. So if you choose not to repent, what does it say in the, in the text? It says in Luke, it says, you will perish. And it's not something that we like. It's not something that we're excited to talk about. It's not that we want to condemn you by no means. Jesus loves you. We love you. But there is a consequence for your sin. And that's why you are called to repentance. No exceptions. It must be intentional repentance. You can't accidentally repent. You can't, maybe one day, you happen to walk down the street, you're like, well, I haven't really done that. Well, I probably repented of that back in the day. No. You have to intentionally own your sin 
recognize it so you can come to the Savior. Do you get that? Jesus says, I came to die for the sick, not the healthy. You have to recognize that you're the sinner. And you have to then go to Christ in faith. But you do that by repentance. You must be intentional. But the last thing on this point that I really want to talk about is it has to be genuine. You have to genuinely be authentic in your repentance. Because, you know, I, I know a lot of you here and we get to talking and I can have, a, I think, a good sense of what you're thinking and how you're doing and how you're living. But I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. We can do our best to kind of discern that. But really, it's only you and God that truly knows your heart. Only you and God truly know. Are you truly repentant? Are you really turning from your sin and changing your mind about that lifestyle so that you can embrace God? Because, I hate to say this, we're a little bit smaller group today, but the odds are, I'm not foolish to say this, not everyone here is probably saved. Not every single person that comes to church on a Sunday morning is a Christian. Now, I would love that they would be. I hope that they will repent and place their faith in Christ, but the sad reality is not every single person that comes to church every week is repenting of their sin and trusting in Christ and being saved. But the good news is that if you choose to repent, you can be. You can be saved. Because there are so many great benefits to the gospel. If you recognize your sin, if you choose to repent of your sin, you can have salvation. You can have freedom from that sin. The way of the escape from by the Lord. You have this good news that this God of the universe loves you and cares for you and sent His Son to die on the cross for you so that you can be saved. He gives you joy, hope, peace, confidence, purpose. All of these things come from someone who chooses to repent and to believe in the gospel. And like I said, I don't want you to feel nervous or scared thinking, well, maybe I'm not repentant. Or maybe I'm not saved. I don't want you to question your salvation, but it is good to examine and see how you're doing. Check your sin. Check your lifestyle. Check your walk with the Lord. Because it's important. With that being said, moving to the final point, repentance is responding to grace. Now, if you thought maybe I've been a little hard on you today, I, I don't mean to be. But hopefully this point will give us a little bit of lifting up and encouragement, some hope here, is that repentance is responding to grace. And what I mean by that is, without God, we would never be able to repent. We would never have the ability or the strength or the know-how or the righteousness on our own be able to turn from our sins. But because of God's grace, we have the ability to do so. There's a few texts I'd like to read. The first one is Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 32. And it says, For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. See, we see the heart of God right here. We see that God doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to die. And that's why He's made it possible. Whenever He calls us to turn, that shows that we have the ability to do so. God calls us to turn. God gives us the ability so that we can turn by His grace, by His convenient grace. He gives it, makes it possible for us so that we can. And what is the promise there? So that we can live. You get that? Repentance is the life preserver. God wants us to turn so that we can have life. Not so that He can judge us. He's not wanting us to look at our sin because He's wanting to judge us and condemn us. Jesus says He didn't want to come into the world to condemn it. But that through Him, the world might be saved. It's all about love and life. Jesus wants you to turn and live. The 
The second verse is Mark chapter 1, verse 15. And it says, And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Because of the grace of God, we have the gospel. God has put you, Acts 17 tells us, He has put you in your pre-appointed places that He knows you're dwelling in your boundaries for the rest of your life. He knows where you are and He put you there for a reason. It says so that you might find Him and grope for Him. God put you in your world and surrounded you in your dwelling places for a purpose so that you can find Him. And so that you have the ability now to hear His gospel message to find out how so good and wonderful and loving this God is. So now you have this ability to hear this, to know this, and now you have the ability to respond by turning, by repenting, by changing your mind about yourself in your life, and renewing it in Christ, in God's Word. So as I said, I want to talk a little bit about it not being a meritorious work. You do not earn salvation. Now, most of us would probably are on board with this, but I had a little bit of trouble with this when I originally was studying this, because I saw some people saying, no, repentance is a work. You don't have to repent to be saved. But, when we think about it, do you have to have faith to be saved? Amen. Yes. But see, repentance and faith are just two sides of the same coin. See, if Christ is over here, I'm facing this direction. And I'm this is my sinful lifestyle. This is my me doing what fills my needs, my desires, my will, right? Before I can follow Christ, which would be faith, and trusting in him, there's something that needs to happen. See that? I must turn so that I can follow. Does that make sense? So God is calling me. He's told me all the reasons. He's given me the ability and the resources so that I can turn. And when you choose to hear that voice, to turn, you have the ability now to follow Him, to receive the many blessings that He's going to guide you. He's going to lead you. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's what happens when you choose to repent. Repentance and faith are so tightly knit you can't separate the two. When you choose to turn from sin, you're necessitating that you're placing your faith and your trust in returning, as I said in the Hebrew, shoo, is returning to God. You're returning to Him. So when you repent, you are placing your faith in Christ. So you're not saving yourself, but repentance is important. And as I said, the gospel is where we have the ability to hear it, to receive it, and as I said at the, very be at the very beginning, if you don't have the understanding of sin or repentance, then you're missing the primary beginning point of the gospel to understand that we must turn from. So, as I said, I gave the two definitions. Turn from sin. Turn from sin so that you can turn to Christ. Change your mind about your life and your will so that you can now have the mind of Christ. And you might be wondering, or some of you might have been really, really been praying for or hoping for a revival in this community, a revival in this church, a revival in our government or our nation, in this world. We all hopefully are wanting that. The thing is, it starts with repentant hearts. You repent which leads to renewing. And renewing leads to revival. So, if you want to see a revival, start with yourself and repent. Turn from sin and trust in Christ. And He's not going to be that person that's just listing out all the things that you still need to work on and do and all that. He's so loving. He's so gracious. He's like the father and the prodigal son. He's just waiting there hug you, to welcome you home. That's what he wants. Repentance is a lifeline. It's not a condemnation. It's not a, um, a 
death sentence. It's a lifeline. And that's what Christ is offering us by the gospel message. So, with that, I want to challenge you, church, and for those who maybe have never come to Christ, you have a choice today. Are you going to choose to repent and believe in the gospel? I hope myself and all of you will join me in saying yes to that. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this time to hear your word, Lord. I pray that I am spoke adequately, Lord, and I allowed you to lead me with your spirit. And Father, I pray that your church heard this and that it had convicted the hearts in a way to look at their lives, to think about their sin and recognize that it is important that we get rid of, relinquish all sin, Lord. And we understand the importance of it, how it leads to salvation so that we can come to understand and experience your great gospel in your great grace and love for us, Lord. So, Lord, as we come now to take this time of communing with you, I pray that we will take this time to truly repent and to turn and to trust in you, Lord. We love you and we are so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.